and I'm also going to enable the closed captioning. Right. Um, so there are four of us, and that's quorum, right? A quorum for you guys is five, because you guys are a group of seven, so it's half plus one. Five? I thought we were four. Oh, wait. Three plus... Four. Yeah. Math plus three, six plus one. Yeah, I thought it so, would be because we're seven, yeah. so it would be four, right? So we're four, right? Yeah, so we have a, okay. yeah, we have a four. Okay, um, so it is not the time it says on my computer. It's six thirty-four, and I am calling the meeting of the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee to order. Um. <clears throat> With the extension of Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. Um, no in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Because sometimes I get a little bit too far away from my computer and people can't hear me. Okay. So I'm just going to make sure everyone can hear each other. Deborah. Yep. I can hear. Perfect. We can hear you. Lisette. I can hear you. Great. We can hear you. And Everald. I can hear you. Wonderful. We can hear you. Okay. So we will go over the agenda. Um, approve minutes from March of last year, May of last year. June of last year and January of this year. Um, what is there a, a is there a thing about if people weren't on the committee at the time that the minutes were made? No, doesn't matter. Oh, you're muted, Jen. They can abstain and or oh. just the co-chairs because both of you guys were there and you guys are both co-chairs. Okay. So can approve them. Um so we have those minute meetings. We'll have public comment at the beginning, member reports. Um, then the action item, action discussion items include Crescent DEI updates, Rob and Youth Empowerment Center updates, um, town councilor liaison, um, which I believe will be Councilor Holla Lord. I'm not sure if that's been made. Official. Yeah, it has actually it has. Um, had the. Yeah, texted me. She said she is going to be the liaison. So okay. yay. Perfect. Um, so that was easy. Um, ARPA <laughs> funds, ARPS school committee budget proposal to town council, civil rights complaints, co-responder and police activities in schools and holding future town forums. Uh, and then more public comment, upcoming agenda items and meeting schedules, and anything that was not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance. Okay, so does anybody have any announcements they would like to make? Jennifer, are there any upcoming DEI events? Sorry, Camille is trying to log on, is having some problems, so I was oh. trying to troubleshoot a little bit. Perfect. Um, so we do have lots of upcoming DEI events. So in May, we have, on May 19th, we have the AAPI Heritage, um, AAPI Heritage Celebration. So that's Asian American Pacific Islanders uh, Celebration. That will be on the town common and or at the middle school, depending on um, weather. We also have the um, Jewish Heritage, Jewish American Heritage celebration that will happen. There are two events. There is one that is, sorry, there is one that is on um, May 7th, and that will be with the town council, and they'll read the proclamation and have a small event. I don't know which is going on with my computer. It just lost everything. So, and then also there will be one on May 26th at Crocker Farm Elementary School. And then, of course, in June, we have the Youth Hero Awards and the basketball tournament and Race Amity Day, as well as Juneteenth. 
Is there a date yet for the Youth Hero Awards? It is June 9th. And what what's the time? It well, it's all day because there's that basketball tournament. So, but mm -hmm. the Youth Heroes and Race Amity Day part and lunch will be from 12 on. Okay. But just yeah, but the basketball too. At what what time? Is just gonna, so I can get the word out. Yep. So registration will start at nine a.m. and the games will start at ten a.m. And that's at Mill River. At Mill River. Okay. Good. Yeah. When you have like a fly or anything, let let me know um, because you know I'll share it with my networks. Absolutely. So um, apparently we have some folks that are having a hard time. So if you guys want to kind of go on with your meeting, and I'll try and troubleshoot with them. Okay. Okay. Um, I do have an announcement. Yes, Everald. Um, so the ZBA voted to um, to build that low income housing that we've been discussing for quite some time now. So that has been fully approved and it is now out there for um, the BIPOC community to um, get in with um, credit counseling, how to qualify for a mortgage and how to get into one of these houses. Um, it is being led by Valley CDC and they are offering free credit counseling um, for people. So anyone that is interested should um, reach out to Valley CDC. Um, I know there's more information about this and should be on the town website, but um, the ZBA has voted for it. So it is moving forward with, um, it is going forward and I think it should be completed in construction, either in a year and a half or two. But for now, what is happening is teaching people how they could qualify for one of these houses. So Great. spread the word. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Great news. And I believe that there is another... Um, development housing development going through some sort of zoning process i'm not sure if it's at zba or the planning board but the um belchertown road and old east street school building so kind of like across the common from where fort river is on southeast street and then around the corner on belchertown road are are supposed to be some affordable units as well including, I believe, 23 that would be um, fully subsidized by the person's income. So that is also in the planning process, but I believe those dates for construction would be farther out, like 2027. Um, but I think they are in the stage of kind of looking for community support um, because they're going for a comprehensive permit um the i think they have to go through like the 40b process so i think there should be some more information at the housing trust meeting tomorrow so i can certainly bring that back to this group um any other announcements all right i'm not seeing any other hands in the zoom room so i guess we can move um approval of minutes should we do that yeah let's do that that's what it says. wait you're saying so we haven't done public comment yet though right we haven't done public comment should oh, we do okay. that first and then approve the minutes i'm just looking at the agenda itself um we can do what do you think public comment or minutes no that's first. fine that's fine i was just yeah i was just wondering okay yeah no go ahead do the the minutes all right. Um, let me see. Hold on. Let me figure out where it is. Okay. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. All right. Um, can you see the meeting packet on the mm -hmm. screen? Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Wait, whoops. I went too far. All right. The first set of minutes is from 
March of 2023. Um, so we talked about press and listening session, DEI update. Uh, Chief Livingstone was retiring at that time. Um, post CSSJC budget, ARPA, public comment. Um, Deborah, do you have anything you would want to change about these minutes, or do you think we can vote on them as is? Yeah, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I haven't had a chance to okay. get any of these, so we can go ahead and go. Um, um, Deb, sorry, Eric, can you check your phone? I didn't know any other way to do that. Do do we want to table the minutes if you haven't had a chance to look at them or do I mean they're old they're so old at this point like I wasn't present for any of this, so if you both think it's okay, then okay. I'll vote to approve it. <laughs> Let's see. I mean, I'm fine with them as is. Uh, I think at this point it's so long ago that I wouldn't remember if things weren't <laughs> as they were anyway, but it seems about right. Um... So, Jen, is this one of those things that we have to do the formal moving and voting and all of that jazz? It's, oh, that's where my pen, the puppy, I dropped my pen and the puppy's got it. Um, <laughs> no, you just need to um, approve them because it's just the two of you, really. Okay. So, I am okay with approving <clears throat> them if you are, Deborah. Also, in the, in the interest of time, and given yeah. that they're so old, yeah. we can throw them in block, like all of them at the same time. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that works. Um, okay. May also looks reasonable to me. And then there was June. Oh, was I at the June meeting? I wasn't there. Um, all right. And then the only ones, okay, so I think that we can approve March, May, and June of 2023. And then the January meeting was of this actual body that's here tonight. Um, does anyone have any concerns about that? those minutes? I don't. Okay. Oh, well, that was a that was the very very short meeting because it was just me. It wasn't a meeting. <laughs> Nobody was. Everybody was unable to come. All right. Yes. So that looks good. All right. I I'm going to go ahead and say we can approve all of them. Um, Deborah, any opposition? No, no opposition. All right. So minutes are approved. <clears throat> And I suppose we will move along to public comment. I'm going to stop sharing screen for now. I can come back to sharing screen afterwards. Um, so I have to read. Uh, during the public comment period, the chair will recognize members of the public. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name, preferred pronouns, and residential address. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes at the well, discretion. Actually, today, let's just do two minutes. Okay. Um, for two minutes at the discretion of the chair based on the number of people who wish to speak. 
No speaker can cede their time to another speaker. CSSJC will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. All right, so if you would like to speak as a member of the public, please raise your hand. Um, I currently have nine attendees in the audience, so. Yeah, we have one, we have Martha. Yes, okay. Hi, I'm Martha Hanner, I live in South Amherst. I just, quick quick comment, I mean, you're, um, you're doing old minutes, which I congratulate you for. I mean, our League of Women Voters has always felt that it's really important for every public committee to keep up to date with their minutes so that the public knows what was going on. And so I'm just curious to, to know who it is that takes the minutes for your meeting. Do you rotate among the members or does your uh, person like Jennifer take them all the time? But uh, anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Martha. Um, and a big thank you to Jennifer, who has usually been the one taking the minutes and who has asked me in the past if I could get somebody to do it. And I have forgotten to ask that at the beginning of the meeting. Um, so if anyone going forward would like to take minutes, feel free, but let us know. Um, All right. Um, if anybody else would like to speak, you may use the raise hand function. If not, there will be a second public comment period at the end of the meeting, um, and you will have another opportunity to speak then. Oh, I see Ms. Pat has her hand up. Good evening. Hello. And thank you all for your time for what you do. I wanna uh, express my deep gratitude for putting upper funds in your agenda tonight. And I have a you know, couple comments I wanna make. So on our town website, our town government uh, you know, launched kindness and um, the DEI department, you know, uh, embarked on project of becoming beloved community. There is nothing wrong with this uh, project, except that it's an irony that the leadership, the leaders of our town are pushing for, you know, residents to, you know, do random kinds of kindness, and yet they are not be able to show kindness to the most vulnerable residents and businesses in our town through the upper funds. Becoming a beloved community is never going to happen unless our town is ready to address injustice, injustices happening in our town. So I just want to put that out it's it's very very ironic to me you know i know you guys will be discussing upper funds tonight i just want you for some for, for some folks who don't know it's not just only bbaa that didn't you know get the last round of upper funds all the bipoc led organization that applied for upper funds did not get it ms media is led by a, bi a BIPOC woman, community connections, and then BBAA, of course. However, all white-led organizations in our town all got the funding. The Senior Center, uh, the Survival Center, the Mobile Market, the Bed, Aka, um, the Drake, um, the family outreach. All these organizations are led by white folks. They all got money, okay? And so if we're becoming a beloved community, I would like to see uh, groups and individuals to address at the minimum 
the inequ uh, inequitable distribution of upper funds. People are still hurting. Also, if you go to our website, uh, um, our town website, you will see bid and the chambers on the website. Okay, so my group, BBAA, has been in existence for eight years. We established in 2016. What message are we sending to people when they go to the town website? And there is a very strong, you know, black business organization in our town, and it's nowhere to be found on the website. Are we really becoming beloved community? Indeed. I just, I will just pause right there, and hopefully I'll have another opportunity to speak on the second public comment. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, one more thing. I'm sorry. One more thing. Can I say quickly? Yes. Okay. So another thing that is that have been bothering me is that our town government, mini town council, town manager, whoever is in charge, has been in the habit of promoting, um, amplifying outstanding people that have been recognized in our town that has served our town, I think it's a great thing to do, but why the double standard? Dr. D. Shabazz, may have so rest in peace, was recognized by our, uh, by Rep. Uh, Dom, and D. served our town as uh, a former registrar and also on this committee, co-chair. Nothing on the website um, Councillor um, Alicia Walker received a Black Excellence in Springfield. This is a, the, one, the most popular councillor in our town, elected twice, and nothing on our website, okay? And the last person, but not the least, obviously, is Dr. Amerko Shabazz. He served on um, reparation town committee, and he was also recognized uh, in Springfield by another group for Black excellence. Nothing, no mention at the town council meeting, nothing on the website. Why is our town government picking and choosing who they promote? Are we really becoming a beloved community? Question mark. Thank you. Thank you. Allegra, you're muted. Um, there are two phone numbers that are on the screen. I'm not sure if you have been if you've asked to speak or have public comment you want to make. Okay. Um, so I'm going to, I don't know. Do I put them back in the audience during our, I feel, I forget how this works. Yeah. It's a weird thing. It says remove permission to talk. And that's, that seems, I don't like the way that it's worded, but I think that's what I do. Right. I put them back in the audience while I, um, oh no. Okay. No, you did it right. Yeah. I just saw. So sorry. Um, I'm putting, I didn't realize apparently these are our, um, Oh, the, the new, phone one in. of them is the new Crest director. Oh, the <laughs> phone in is, is Pamela and Camille? Yes, but now they're gone. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to touch it. And if, if Jennifer wants to be the technical wizard, I will stop trying to let people in or out. Yeah, Jennifer, we didn't know that the phone ins were, were Camille and, um, and Pamela. So, yeah, can, can we try to figure it out so that we can bring them in? Can they rename themselves? Well, I guess if they're in the phone, they probably yeah. can. 
Um, can I rename them? <laughs> Should I will stop talking. I will stop doing things. Do we know why they can't get in? Actually, I think you can, Allegra, rename them. I can. Um, I'm just going to guess. And if they're, if it's the wrong person, then I uh, am apologetic. But Can we just not put the phone, people with the phone numbers back on? And then I'm going to, I think Sean and I have figured out a way to handle this. Okay. So if, if just, I change I'm their names, shooting. yes. Does that work that then that I can works. put them? In and if it's not the right name with the right right phone number, yep. then nobody will ever know except them. <laughs> yep. Thanks. All right. Hello. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Hi, Hi. this is Pamela. Uh, I I have tried multiple times. Jennifer's tried with me, and for some reason, I'm not being able to get in. Um, yeah, but Sean Jennifer, it asked, sounds like you and Sean. Yep. Yeah, he, yep. He's asked that the two of you sign into your actual zoom account instead of trying to use an, the link that's there. Okay. All right. Um, can we, we might have to try to walk Camille through, I don't know if she's signed in through her, uh, into her town zoom account previously. So I'm not sure if she'll know how to do that. And she and I both also tried the public link and had trouble doing that. But all right, I yeah, um, he's saying because I'm going to try to have the an actual Zoom account that the you need to sign in through the Zoom link first. Okay. Through Zoom first. All right. Camille, I'll... do you know how to do that? Are you set up to do that? I doubt if she is. Oh, she's muted right now, so. So okay. can I propose that, well, if we have any member reports, we can do that. And then maybe if Kit, Camille, and Pamela are still trying to figure out the technology, we can go to like the ARPA funds thing first. And then when they're squared away, we can do Crescent DEI. Does that, is that an okay plan or? Sure, I, I'm able to hear hear you guys. I'm I'm trying to sign into the Zoom account now. Oh. Um so do we have any member reports? Well, I think we'll we'll, we'll end up talking about it in more uh specific as we have it on the uh agenda in terms of the um you know school committee budget and mm -hmm. then the ARPA funds, but just to say that. You know, I've gone to a variety of town council meetings and um, school committee meetings to um, the school committee. The regional school committee meeting was around the budget that we'll be discussing later. And then obviously town council meeting um, in support of the budget, as well as ARPA funds for a BBAA and um, making sure that those are, are equitably distributed. So, but we'll talk more um, from the agenda. Um anybody else have any member reports oh i am not seeing police search as an update and i meant oh, yeah. everald to... is there anything like timeline wise that you can share with us about the police search so i i think it's appropriate that it's um off our agenda, and I say this because um, we had our town forum, um, open forum last Tuesday, where the public had a chance to um, ask her two finalist questions and form their opinion. And they were also for the opportunity to provide feedback to town manager um, via our websites on um, until, I think it was until Friday or this Friday. So this. Um, but in terms of timeline, what the committee is doing now is we're having internal discussions as to whether or not to make a formal recommendation as to one candidate or the other, but we cannot publicly discuss um, who we are recommending um, to the town council. Um, and at that point, he will meet with his internal team and make a decision as to whether or not to choose one of those people or to 
um, reject both or one. Um, his timeline, I am not aware of um, just yet, but the goal here is to submit the committee's final recommendation to him, hopefully by Friday. So you're, when you're saying him, you're saying town the town manager? Yes. All right. So, yeah, I mean, I thought that that was on the agenda. So that was a um, kind of mistake because I thought we were going to talk about that. Because, yeah, I was also at the um, at the police chief forum um, and I did want to talk more about that. <laughs> so do we talk about it here then? Since it's I'm not sorry, I'm because I'm, I'm having multiple conversations, but I believe that the update for Cress and is the not an update for police chief on the agenda? Nope, it's not. I don't on think there. so. I don't see it. But we're talking about it, so Debbie hmm. can talk about it in here. Yeah, I just want to make sure. Um. So yeah, so I guess my questions, Avril, since you're on the committee, is that you know I I did go to where there, there was the two um, candidates. Um. So. Yeah, my, I'm switching her if I can. My question is, will, will, you know, are these the only candidates type of thing? Are there going to be any others that we're going to get to see? Or is the town manager going to make his, his uh, pick from these two candidates? These are the two, final, these are the two finalists. Um, so he will either pick one from the two or say, I want to see other people. Mm hmm mm hmm yeah. Yeah, because I did, you know, I went to it and I did provide um comments, commentary too, through the kind of provide feedback and everything. Um, you know, obviously one is external, which you know we don't know much about, but of course talked a lot about being about inclusivity and um outreaching to the community and things like that, which I like to hear. Um, Ting is internal. I did like hearing about his background and the story of, you know, his immigration story. I'm an immigrant to this country, so I was excited to hear that. Um, but I didn't like the the way he he responded to a lot of my questions, especially around questions um, related to CSSJC and um, to the work of outreach into the community and and you know around. Get down, get down, baby. Mm -hmm. And then around July fifth. So, um, so anyway, so I guess you know, out of the two two candidates, <laughs> I guess I would be more supportive of the ex external, given that, um, um, you know, there's only two choices. So they both have resumes um, published online from um, when the announcements were sent out for the town halls. Both their resumes were published. And so you can, um, people can actually go on there and see what they've done. And um, to your point, Gabe is local and yes, everything is known about him. And um, Lieutenant Ahern um, is not, but I, I think if people want to do Google searches, a lot of information is out there about him and see the things that he's done. Um, in terms of this committee, um, if the committee as a whole wants to, you know, submit a letter on behalf of the committee to town manager, I don't think that'd be inappropriate. Um, mm -hmm. I just don't think I could be part of it given that I am chairing the search committee. Okay. Yeah. That's a good idea. But that would have to be probably sooner rather than later. Cause aren't you all, um, isn't the search would... committee going to be making the formal recommendation? Bye. I would I would suggest yes sooner rather than later. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, but I guess even yeah. if we don't send it to you, even if it's not in time for 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 the now, recommendation, it can also just go um directly to the town manager. You you can, and I'm I'm saying if you want to submit something, you can because I I think um you, you were there that I believe some officers came and voiced support for. Um, Chief Tang. So um, mm -hmm. I think we're open to having those kinds of, um, you know, mm -hmm. support voiced either for or against. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But yes, given that um, the public forums have concluded, mm -hmm. um, I think sooner rather than later would be probably best just to make sure um, the voices are heard. Okay.
Okay, so it looks like Pamela and Camille made it through inside right. to the meeting. I apologize for all of that. There's, I had to call IT and they'll work on it because it's happened in a couple other meetings, unfortunately. So, um, so welcome to Camille. <laughs> Camille is the new Good press evening. director. Um, so that's exciting. Um, I don't know if we want to go around and introduce ourselves. Um, and then maybe Camille can give us just a brief blurb. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, and just to say, you know, Camille, obviously, you know, we're very excited that you're on board um, and that Crest has a new director. And yeah, I think, you know, it would be more so to kind of get, you know, more like an introduction from us for us to be able to tell you who we are on this group, right? And for you to uh -huh. be able to tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, because obviously we know you just started on the eighth, so <laughs> we want to be fair to you and everything. <laughs> Um, day but, three, you know, <laughs> day two, actually, since uh, being sworn in. So exactly. Um, and then, but then, uh, you know, obviously, Pamela, you know, after we do the intros and and Camille does her intro, it would be just to kind of get an idea from you in terms of what the transition has been like, though, you know, and and, and the steps you all have been taking as as things get transitioned to Camille. Um, but that being said, I can introduce myself. Uh, so my name is Deborah Ferreira. Um, I uh, am have been a resident of Amherst for, well, let me see, probably a total of like 27 years, something like that, because I, um, I went to UMass as an undergrad, left for 10 years, and then came back, and I've been here like 22 years. Um, you know, both my kids, uh, my oldest went through the Amherst um, school system, and he's uh, in college right now, a sophomore. Mm -hmm. And then my youngest is in the middle school. He's a 14, 14 years old. Um, I'm an attorney. I work for the uh, uh, the university, UMass Amherst. Um, my entire career has been in civil rights, diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, I have directed, you know, the Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity at UMass, um, as well as been the Title IX officer, ADA compliance officer, chief diversity officer for the university. But now I'm back to my attorney roots and I, I'm general counsel um, with the university, um, which means I'm part of their, the legal team for the entire um, university system. Um, so that's my day job. Um, but what I do obviously is, um, uh, you know, also a community activist. I like to advocate for equity, um, inclusion, diversity, social justice for people in general, right, in the community. Um, and like I said, that's my life. That's that's what I do. And I'm an immigrant to this country. I was born in West Africa. I'm from Cape Verde Islands. Um, and obviously growing up in the United States as an immigrant, you go through a lot of challenges. You go through a lot of um, dealing with isms, right? Sexism, racism, xenophobia, um, and so on and so forth. So for me, it's a goal of mine to make sure that others don't have to go through that, that my kids don't have to go through that, right? Um, and so that's why I do the work that I do. Um, and that's why I've dedicated my life to, to this type of work. Um, and why I got involved was after the George, George Floyd murder, um, which unfortunately was yet again, another black man uh, murdered. Um, I really, you know, of course I took part in demonstrations and things like that in Amherst, but um, I didn't want something like that to um, happen again one, and obviously I wanted to do other things besides do demonstrations. Um, and so that's why when I got nominated to join the Community Safety Working Group, I was one of the um, original members of that group. And a lot of the, hopefully Camille, you'll get a chance to read the reports that the Community Safety Working Group uh, put together, uh, part A, part B, and um, seventh generation collective movement, um, report too, that was the consultant that we got to uh, put um, together a report for us. And then LEAP also was another consultant that we contracted to get us information for the part B. Um, and so, you know, I took part in that and then I became a part of the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee, which is the committee that you're here with us today. Um, and, you know, one of the things that CSSJC were about is monitoring and making sure that the recommendations that CSWG put together, Community Safety Working Group put together, that they are going to be put in place and monitored. 
Um, and so some of the recommendations have been put in place, others have not, and that's something that we continue to do. But we also are an advisory group to the town council, even though a lot of times the town council don't use us as such. Um, we obviously are very much committed to CRESS um, being successful, being fully um, in place and actualizing its full potential in terms of the mission and vision that CSWG put, put together. Um, and we're very commi committed to that. I'm very committed to that. And um, and obviously, you know, the Youth Empowerment, Multicultural, uh, Multicultural Center, uh, Resident Oversight Board, and so on and so forth. But I'll stop here, um, but I wanna, you know, welcome you and obviously very excited and, um, you know, looking forward to working with you on these issues. Next person. Avril, I, can, I don't know if you wanna go. I, I can go. Hi, Camille. Um, nice to meet you. Welcome. Uh, my name is Everald Henry. Um, I'm a local attorney in Amherst. I do a lot of immigration and criminal work. In my criminal work, I take um, cases for people who cannot really afford attorneys. Um, I am part of this committee, um, CSS, JC, as well as the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, I am very vested in social justice. And so this is an opportunity for me to serve. I know that you are new and there's gonna be a lot of things on your plates, a lot of um, moving parts and people coming in from all angles. So just wanna say that we're here to help any which way that we can. And don't be afraid to lean on us like Deborah said. And so just welcome. Okay. Lisette, did you wanna go? Sure. Um, good evening, Camille. My name is Lisa Paredes. Um, I'm a resident of South Amherst. I have lived here for roughly maybe 24 years now. Um, I myself did go through the Amherst public systems with the exception of high school. I'm currently a sessions clerk um, in a Springfield District Court, specifically in the criminal department. I joined this board in August of 2023, so I'm relatively new member to this um, board. Um, I will say that just about every Wednesday, I am learning something very new. Um, and I think that it's safe to say that some of the other members in the board as well, certain things are new to them as well. Um, so I say that so that you know that you will be constantly learning on every if if you were to join our meetings on Wednesdays um but our chairs Allegra and Deb they are really great at providing information and being very good at guiding us through this um board meetings um I actually this is my first board that I have joined in regards to so social justice um and equity so it's 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 been very um interesting so far for the last few months um you know i've lived in amherst like i said for x amount of years 24 but there's a lot going on in the community that i really wasn't aware of until i actually joined this board um and some of it it actually really does surprise me um how different things are with you know different members of the town of amherst but that's it for now Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. Um, and so I'm Allegra Clark. We met at your interview, um, but I am the co-chair with Deborah. And um, so during the day, I am a social worker. I work between the Holyoke and the Palmer District Courts um, doing involuntary commitment hearings for substance use and mental health. Um, and I had previously done that when I was living in Boston. So I think one of the things that kind of struck me was just the disparity I would see in the courts, whether it was out here or in Boston between um, kind of just the treatment throughout the process of white people versus people who aren't white. Um, and I feel that I am in a role that does interact with with communities that might not come to the court as a place for help. Um, and mm -hmm. so thinking about that in the community and thinking about 
some some communities in Amherst might not see the police as a group that can help them, I did become pretty interested in the work that um, the local defund group was doing in terms of trying to get some money rerouted from the police department into some alternatives. Um, and that was kind of before Cress was called Cress, that was what ho people were hoping to see. So I, I've been really invested in the idea of something like Cress being here um, and being an alternative for people who might have had negative experiences with in the criminal legal system or who don't feel comfortable with the police for whatever reason, but still might need some assistance um, from a public safety department. So that was what kind of drove me to join CSSJC as well as obviously my background um, professionally, um, because I do think that there are, there are ways that my work could be improved by having a resource like Cress in a community like Amherst. So um, that's why I'm here. And I um, I graduated from Amherst High School myself, so I do have um, that kind of aspect of coming back to this community after having been away for a while and and now being a grown up here as opposed to like being a kid, it's, mm -hmm. it's different. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I did want to get involved in making Amherst a better place for everyone to be, so. I think that's all of our board members. We'd love to hear a little bit more about you. Sure. Uh, good evening to you all. Um, as you know, my name is Camille Theriak. I am a retired firefighter. I did was in my 20th year when I retired in Holyoke. Um, I was the one of the first women on in Springfield and then was um, laid off the day before we graduated. And I came to Holyoke a year later. Um, there were two women and then one went back. So it was me by myself with all the men for seven years. Um, I also am the first lieutenant on the department woman and also the first uh, black lieutenant in the state of Massachusetts woman, female. Um, I was on the critical instant stress management team. I did work with the hazmat team. I taught at the fire academy. Um, I worked as a Red Cross instructor. Um, very community oriented. I love working with people. And after I left the fire service, I went back to school with the intention of just getting my associate's degree and then found a love for, well, I always knew I love psychology, but became a social worker. And most recently, I was a clinician for the PAC program for BHN, which is Progressive Assertive Community Treatment, which is wraparound services. So I'm very familiar with wraparound services and getting out in the community. Um, and Allegra, you would understand this because some of our people, one of them in particular was recently before I left in the Palmer court system after you know they were questioning a section 12. So um, I'm familiar with those and very much so understand that there has to be something better than calling, um, the police or the fire department or anyone else to aid some of our residents, our neighbors. Um, actually, it was kind of funny. Um, the week before, the week before I was um, sworn in, I was sitting in my house and all of a sudden the front door, I'm knocking, you know, went to the door, opened it. And there's two police officers there, two cars in front of my house. And I'm like, Hi, you know, I said, do you have a dog I'm thinking? Yes. Well, you know, some of some of one of your neighbors was concerned because they saw the dog out and they were worried about you. And I'm thinking to myself. No one, my next door neighbors, if they were worried about me, would come over here. So why are they sending the police to my house? Because my dog is outside and it was like 45 degrees. And that really 
hit home again about um, utilizing police for things that they don't need to be there for. You know, um, somebody, you know, if somebody, if one of my neighbors, and I know it wasn't one of my immediate neighbors that knows me because they would have just called me or come over. So, um, but situations like that. And I've also had other situations where I have been dealing with someone and um, had them get angsty with like firefighters being around or someone else being around and being able to be there to de-escalate a situation is very important. Well, and it is, I, that is the, you know, one of the missions of Crest is just to, to be there and to be supportive for the community. And that is my intention. So thank you. Okay. Um, it, one quick question for you. Hopefully you'll be able to meet with us when we have our meetings. We meet once a month on Wednesdays. Um, so hopefully, do you think you'll be able but, to attend our meetings? So what I would like to do actually is to meet individually with people when we can work it into our schedules, because um, I want to get a sense of what each of you bring to the table and what your thoughts are on what can be done um, and different ways of doing things. And I find that working one-on-one -on -one with people works a lot better than getting in a group of um, folks where you know a uh, quieter person may not necessarily speak up as much as someone like me who is very vocal mm -hmm. yeah i think that would be great but i was i'm wondering whether it could be an and both though you know what i'm saying because the only the only reason why i'm i'm asking and i'm sure allegra and others will ask if you are able to attend our meetings is just that you know this is public and so then uh -huh. we can discuss issues and then the, and then the community can hear, right? And they can be, they can have the knowledge and they can know what's going on and things like that. And sometimes if people can't attend our meetings, they go to the recordings. So then they 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 find the information. So, you know, for us, that's the other thing is that we like to impart information to the community because we know knowledge is power. Um, yes. Because unfortunately, a lot of information about Crest and other things um, the community they don't find out about. And so one of the avenues in which they can find out about things is through our meetings. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so that's why if, if you're able to, I mean, I'm, I am I love the, the fact that you want to meet with us individually. That's that's great. And I'll, I'll look forward to that and I will welcome it. But also if you're able to attend our meetings so that we can kind of discuss issues because it's, it's once a month. It's not like we meet, we don't usually meet more than that. Then mm -hmm. we can kind of bring, you know, topics and what happens too is that a bunch of us we all have like different people that are part of our networks and so they tell us things and they they ask us to ask questions you know on their behalf so we're kind of like also a voice for the community um so it becomes that type of of exchange too yes so in the future i will be able to go right now you know there's so much that's going on and just coming in and um coming up with the end of the fiscal year and everything else there's a lot of work to be done um as i've called it crest 3.0 so um you know my goal is and i know everyone's goal is to see this to work you know, and not just to work, to be emulated in other communities because it works so well. So, mm -hmm. okay. All right. Well, we'll, we'll continue to let you know. And then obviously when you can make it, that would be great. Definitely. And open invitation and we'll continue to um, share our meeting times and dates and things like that, which is Thank usually, you so much. Actually, actually, I'll just let you know. It's a, what is it? Second Tuesday of the month at 6.30. Second <laughs> Wednesday. Okay. Oh, second Wednesday. So Wednesday. Second Wednesday of the month at 6.30. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I guess um, in terms of what Cress has actually been up to, I don't know if everybody got a chance to look at the um, public records request response that was sent, um, but it does it did break down the calls over the left from November 11th until about the beginning of March. Um, and there were some definitely interesting things, but I don't know, Pamela, before 
we launch into that, do you have any updates as to kind of the transition or anything else that that would? Sure. Let me um, go over what has happened. Obviously, this is just day three, so there's <laughs> not a lot that has happened in the last uh, two and a half days. But the transition team, the interim leadership team was uh, present for Camille swearing in on Monday. Um, we have tried to schedule her so that she's not just meeting rapidly people um, and not having a lot of time to process. So um, so the plan was over this first month, she would have individual meetings with various department heads. Um, she has begun that process. I think she met with DPW um, today and we prioritize the department heads that have um, a lot of interactions with the Crest Department and because of the interaction with DPW and members of the unhoused population. So they are, um, her meeting with Guilford and Amy was placed higher up uh, on the priority. She's also meeting with um, members of the community from the social service uh, agencies. So the schedule is being coordinated by one of the members of the, or one of the responders who will send to you guys a link so that you can find an individual time to meet with her. Um, she's shadowing all of the responders. Uh, she's planning to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with, uh, with each of the responders. And by shadowing, what I mean is that um, the responders have different assignments in teams of two. And so she's accompanying them to their various locations. For example, she, I think this week, so probably yesterday, went to the Amherst Survival Center and had a chance to meet with Lev and um, and had a tour of the center. So that's happening with teams of responders. So she gets one-on-one -on -one time with them as a team. She's being introduced to different social service agencies. She will um, have one-on-one -on -one meetings with department heads. Um, let's see. One of the things that we thought was really important was, so a lot of energy from the interim leadership team has gone into creating what, um, Chief Nelson called a continuity book. So she has two gigantic binders of materials um, and those materials include information about the Crest budget, like the three funding sources. Um, it includes information uh, and copies of the DPH grant. Um, it includes both uh, reports A and B from the Community Safety Working Group as well as the LEAP report. We asked each of the responders to write their own, you know, short biography to share with her so that she, they could, in their own words, um, describe their work and who they are and what they bring to the department. So they did that individually. Um, uh, and, and that's in the binder. The interim leadership team also wrote reports on each of the responders for what we see as the strengths and weaknesses and you know, areas for growth, that's also in the binder. So she got a perspective from the responder, the responders themselves, as well as from the interim leadership team. Um, and so we're at, trying to really moderate the process because obviously it is overwhelming uh, taking on the responsibility of a, uh, as director of this department as it's still growing and in transition. And, and I've, I think I've said to the responders and to anyone who will listen to me, I think even as a member of the interim leadership team who had been hearing Earl's reports for over a year, it took quite a bit of time to sort of have um, an in-depth sort of knowledge of what was happening. And so we're trying to really give her all of the materials that she would need to sort of take the time to read about these various areas as well as to spread out some of the meetings so that you know she's not just meeting one person after the other without having some context to it. Um, so that's all happening. And the, the plan is that within the first month, you know, she would have made the rounds to all of the departments um, as well as to community partners and have an opportunity to meet with those of you for who are um, would like to meet with her one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and uh, I have 
well, actually all of the interim leadership team. So Sergeant Griffin has moved out of the space that she was occupying. I now go into my DEI space. Uh, the One of the practices that the interim leadership team started was having a team meeting every morning. So Camille is there, you know, Kat Newman, who was part of the uh, of the leadership team is there, but the rest of us have not been around. You know, we are, we are, as she's stepping up, we're stepping back. I, I think we're trying to be selective about how, what areas we pro provide support. So this be really becomes her department. Um, so I did attend with her today, uh, a meeting with uh, one of the um, members of the accounting department who's over the DPH grant, because there's some things that are coming up for the grant that we need to bring her up to speed with. Um, I have been notifying, and I, I think the other interim leadership team members have well, like all of the meetings that we did with the Harvard GPL and the uh, Council of State Governments, um, and even with the DPH, we've been stepping back and introducing Camille as the new director so that she can move into those spaces. So I think, um, I think, that the pace that we've tried to outline is one that will allow her to really learn the department and the people and the key issues in a rate at a rate that will allow her to be effective, right? Not just to dump everything on on her. So, and Camille, if I've left something out, please. Not that I can think of, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the puppy. No, it, it's been a um, invigorating three days. Um, and I am really pleased at the the welcome, welcoming that I've gotten from people. Um, and I have a notebook I've already started of concerns and ideas. Um, and again, I'm meeting with my responders. Um, I put out an email to them about some things that we could talk about and where they are and where they'd like to go. Um, and what, you know, their, what their gifts are, what their skills are that we can work on um, to, to make Cress even better. Um, uh, Pamela, in the meantime, though, um, dispatch is still dispatching calls to Cress and um, responders are still responding to. Oh, yeah. I mean, so the operations are are going on um, as normal. There's, you know, there hasn't been a change in the operations. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, this is uh, my opinion, I think that one of the next big steps for the department will be expanding the call types. Um, that's probably not likely to occur right away because one of the things that we build into the onboarding for Camille, and I don't even know if we've had a chance to, she might be hearing this for the first time. I don't know <laughs> if everybody has has shared with her, but um, you know, we the interim leadership team was successful in getting an additional $25,000 for from the Department of Public Health um, to support the department. And the vast, the bulk of that money is meant to be spent on three site visits um, that the, the that Camille as the new director and the responders mm -hmm. and maybe um, if possible, a member of dispatch would take to other um, alternative units so that they can see firsthand how dispatch is working in other communities and and use that as a way to you know to learn about how it might how dispatch might work here so um, those none of those trips are have been scheduled we really just tried to hold all of the major decisions um, uh, until the time that a director was announced and in, in the office so that that person could participate. Um, and, and that's true, I would say, of all of the upcoming major activities. So as much as possible, we tried to delay the work of the Harvard GPL so that their work, their primary work would not be with the interim leadership team, but would, would be with the new director. 
um, that uh, Harvard GPL grant is supposed to end um, in June. Um, we have expressed, meaning the interim leadership team has expressed that a desire to reapply so that you know Camille would have the benefit of working with them um, for an ex more extended period of time. Um, and although you know they haven't guaranteed that that will happen, there is there has there have been other communities who've been the recipient of multiple years and have had more than one year of support. And we're hoping that that would be the case for for Amherst as well. So can I ask a question based on the public records request? I don't sure. know if you've had a chance to look it over, but. So um, one, one thing too, though, because yeah. I, I don't think the, the, the public records information was added to the agenda, was it? No. Um, I, it's, I don't, I don't think so. But so all I'm saying is that asking think question. It would fit under Chris. I'm going to put it under Chris. Um, no, but I'm saying, but I'm saying we didn't share it, like the public records itself. Oh, though. like it's not, I mean, I, I'm going to, I can share my screen right now. If that yeah, works. that's fine. But all I'm saying is that I, what I want to do is let's, let's talk about it right now, but then let's mm -hmm. add it, add it again to next. Uh, okay. Yeah. Months, because I want to add it to the agenda. So it's there and, and then, you know, so we can discuss it and so that the community has an opportunity to digest the information. But yeah, if you could share your screen and ask the questions, but I think we want to also share it with the community. Absolutely. Um, so I I don't know who did all of this formatting or if this is already how you were formatting it, but it did help like break it down into easy to digest information. Right. So that was really helpful for me. And I did like that. Can you, can you explain it a little bit? Because I guess yes. the community, yeah. Um. So each, so... The, there was a template that had press had X number of calls, the most popular. Oh, sorry, like let me let me stop you. So just so yes. folks who are listening in, and then for folks who are going to listen to the recording. So what happened was that um, uh, Allegra and I talked right about doing a public records request to get information on Crest and Crest calls and and you know uh, what Crest has been working on um, for the past um, two years. And so this was the information because with public records is whatever records that's already in existence. And so this was the information that we got. Um, and then I guess, you know, and they can charge um, for for the, the information. So I guess in order for us to get any other information, then we'd have to pay over $600 is I guess what the bill is that they sent me. So, um, you know, which obviously that's not gonna be doable, um, but we did get this information. Uh, for now and then you know once we kind of dissect this information then you know I'll see whether I, I want to that's the other thing we can tweak our our request um, and maybe you know send it uh, in a different way to possibly get other information is, is what I'm thinking so yeah. can um may I sort of just give you an overview of what you have as a um before you um or Allegra do you want to start because the um i think it would be helpful to understand a little bit about the process and what you have what what you asked for i mean this is only a portion of of what you of what mm -hmm. was asked for right no um, yeah that's what i'm saying because if i want yeah. the rest of it then it's 600 and something dollars yeah. which so, is a lot <laughs> yeah so, so <laughs> let so let, is, is that all right if i just talk about what the the how we gathered the information that you that's there or do you want to just do, do you want to um I, Allegra, explain what 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 you have well I guess I guess the question would be and then you can kind of explain the question would be was this was what was produced something that you guys were already tracking internally kind of in this informal way because there's no like we know there's no like data collection system or whatever but this like was this something that you had as kind of like an internal stopgap, or or was this something that you had to go back to day one to like re? Right. Yeah, so I think it. I think my overview will help um, clarify and answer that question. So there are now two different data sets that the department had, and and um, 
the first data set um, is you don't have any of that information. That the dates for that data set are September 6 of 2022, which is the day that the the um, uh, first responders were deployed to November 6 of 2023. Um, and that data set uh, uh, is like, you know, I, I'm not the technical person. It, it's like thousands of pages and um, would it was not collected in the same manner as this um, template. Um, and so it would, it re would require uh, IT going through this process to extract the data and then having it read by, um, you know, someone in, in the Crest Department and checking to see if there are any exemptions or if information need to be redacted. So um, IT provided me with uh, their process, like as simply as possible, knowing that I'm gonna be the one who try to explain it. So what they have is like step one is that we have to query the database for the parameters they're searching for. Uh, which in this case is all of the data records for that time period that I just described. And then the results of that query are compiled into a digestible form. So, you know, they're doing some things um, internally to, to help sort out the data. And then the, the information is then divided by individual records. So for that first data set, you don't, you don't have any of that information. The second data set is November 6 um, to 2023, and you have a portion, you have uh, November 6 to the date of the um, public records request, which was, I believe, um, March 4th. Or you might, you, because it was, that second data set is, is being kept internally, you, you might actually have beyond uh, March 4th. So you have that information. And then the other information that you have is the CAD reports from December 18th, which is when they started to use the uh, dispatch system to March 4th, which is the date of the public records request. So you have two of the three types of uh, data sets that would be um, available to uh, uh, are, uh, you know, that have information about the department. Um, the, the thing that uh, I think is really important to know and I, what I've been saying repeatedly is that the data methodology for that first data set, which um, uh, is quite different from the methodology from the data set too. So when you, when you see this week ending template, um, these, uh, this is a process that uh, the interim leadership team and the responders um, uh, created so that they could start to gather information in a way that um, I would argue was more accurate. Um, and then uh, what we know coming up, and this is a meeting that Camille will have, uh, happen, will have next week, is that the Donahue Institute recommended that the town purchase uh, the Qualtrics software system. So there, there will be a the um, the software system will create yet a a fourth data set, um, and will ref will refine what we sort of put in as a stopgap measure. Um, that contract has been signed. It's a three year contract. Um, uh, uh, next week, Camille has a preliminary, like just short meeting with the IT and Qualtrics to start the process of creating um, that next um, data collection methodology. We've been told by IT and by Qualtrics um, that they work, you know, fairly quickly. They're certainly happy that they got the contract and they're anxious to really work with us. Um, I, um, I know that it's likely that, um, and I may be speaking out of turn, but it's likely that it will be in place by the beginning of the, of the new uh, fiscal year. I think the one big question mark is that 
the Department of Public Health has required that the um, Crest Department utilize the Donahue Institute again to assess the work that has been done. And before we completely finalize any work with Qualtrics around the design of their data collection methodology, will want to have the results of the second assessment by Donahue so that we are designing a, a, um, a data collection methodology that captures everything that needs to be captured. So there are still a few question marks, but it is moving, you know, it's moving ahead. So I just, I think that context is really important to know. Thank you. So I guess that being said, if this was something that was kind of developed internally, this template as kind of a stopgap, is that something that we would have to request each time, like for each meeting and, and then wait 10 days and then wait another 10 days to get it? Or is this something that like you can share or I guess Camille could share as a, you know, as part of the update that we ask for as on an ongoing basis as this committee um since it is kind of de-identified it's not like there's anything that needs to be redacted and just like numbers you know right so i um so the reports are done on a weekly monthly and quarterly basis i think it, that would be camille's decision right no. but the the process is it has been in has been in place since november to start no you know, um, what I would say is a more accurate data collection methodology. Um, so, and then, so I'm just looking at the first week, for example. So it has the number of Crest calls. And so that specifies the number of people who called to Crest directly, not dispatch calls that were then dispatched to Crest. No, so there, so language and, and definitions are, are really important. I think probably what needs to be provided to you and they have, um, they have changed a little bit are the definitions for what um, the different call types. So I, um, uh, the Crest calls are, are, are any calls that have been report, well, yeah, if, so in November, it would have been calls that are coming in directly to the department. I, you'd have to look, and I haven't, I haven't like, I did not do a lot of the in-depth work around the data collection. Mm -hmm. So we'd have to look at the December reports or the reports after December 18th to see if there's a distinction between the calls that are coming in through dispatch and the calls that are coming in directly into the uh, department. One of the things that I know that um, the interim leadership team and the responders have tried to do is to, um, to make sure that the definitions for the different call types um, are, uh, are accurate. And, um, and so they're probably between when the department first started in November and when the department went on dispatch, there might have been a few changes in definitions. And if this is sort of the, the I would say, um, as the department has learned and has worked with, um, with the dispatch center, we, they've gotten better at um, defining the calls. And I think, I don't, you know, I think we, yeah. we shared that there was a there was an incident where a call um, someone called in directly to dis called in directly to the Crest Department. There was also a call. I think we discussed this that mm -hmm. went directly into the town manager's office, and then a call that went directly into dispatch for the same incident. So figuring out some of those nuances. Um, um, you know, is it's still an on it, that's still I would say an ongoing um, matter for the department. So, 
I wanted to go because I I took some time with it yesterday. Okay, so these are like the weekly number thingies. So let's see where the first. Sorry, I'm going super fast. Um, okay, so this would be the week starting the 17th, ending the 23rd. Mm -hmm. um, and so now it has origin as dispatch. And here we have zero. And then there's phone calls in. So when I was going through this, and I don't know if you would know the answer to this question or not weird. Um, okay, so the first call from dispatch came in the week of 1224. So that was one call. And then there was one the week, the next week. And then I, I believe that there was maybe one more and that was all I saw. Okay. So then yeah, one, one, one over there. Yeah. yeah one. 128. And so that was, those were the only calls. I know that's really small. Um, but then yeah, another zero. So I only had counted three calls being coming in through dispatch between the 18th and the, and then that's the monthly report, um, the 18th and the 5th or whatever day that is. Yeah, that seems inaccurate to me. I thought, and I um, did not gather this information okay. and I thought that you had the CAD reports in it, mm -hmm. but I don't know, ex I mean, I'm, I am not the expert on, on looking at the, at the reporting system, but so that, we, oops. that number seems, seems um, low to me. Okay. I don't know if I, that seems accurate. I think I, um, it may be worthwhile to, um, to ask Sergeant Griffin to join to explain the process because um, calls are are being reported through dispatch if they are self initiated or if they're coming direct from dispatch and I don't know the dis the difference between how that is recorded. Okay, I do. I I think that would be helpful um, yeah. to get that kind of drilled down because it three seemed very low to me and it seemed right. like kind of disappointing yeah. honestly um mm -hmm. and so I think getting clarification on that would be helpful then there was the idea there was a category where it says unsafe calls and I don't know if you can read that but I is that just something that is triggered as like there's the potential that this could be unsafe to, and we are not sending the responders out or is this like Maybe yeah, we I, should let the police know that we might be requesting backup or what does yeah. a potentially unsafe call mean? So I, I don't know. I don't have any knowledge of the, of those definitions. I just, I don't know. Cause I, I, um, I haven't been involved. So I think this section of the report okay. is the CAD report. Yes. Yeah, well, oh. those, those though, I think we want to be careful in terms of show notes because those need to be redacted. Yes, there were some that were <laughs> so, not redacted. I just, if yeah. I, there's one, I just want to see, because it was around February something that it seemed as if perhaps, the okay, so here it is, um, assisted the Amherst Regional Middle School with seventh and eighth grade lunch support. Mm -hmm. And that was like, it like looked like it was kind of an ongoing thing that now the responders are doing. Is that accurate that they're going to the middle school regularly for lunch duty? Yeah. Uh, I think is, that I thought that we had reported on that, that a request came from the superintendent's office um, and through the middle school um, um, principal, well, high school and middle school principal, that because of the staffing issues, okay at the school there um so the they there was a request to see if um if responders could uh, provide the um some support to the schools and so they have been doing that on a regular basis all right so in other words it would be a really bad idea for the schools to cut an additional 10 percent of their staff <laughs> just saying um but yeah. no, I mean, I think, well, but, but, but then that, yeah, but that concerns me because obviously, you know, 
as we've been discussing for a, a, a long time, that um, CRES is, is an alternative to policing. And CRES is not just a social service um, department. It's a, it is responding to nonviolent, any nonviolent concerns and that should be the focus. I mean, I understand obviously, you know, the, the issues that the schools are having, as you said, Allegra, that even more reason, right? That our schools get, get the funding and that the budget, you know, is increased and that they get budget that they don't have to beg every year for money, you know, and we'll talk more about that. But I don't know if it is Cress's responsibility though, to be filling in during lunch. You, you, you see what I'm saying? I mean, and those are some of the things that, because that's not the original original mission vision of CRESS. The original mission vision, as I said, is alternative to policing. Do the police, you know, go out to the to staff lunch? You see what I'm saying? I'm just kind of like, no, it's an alternative. So if anything that's nonviolent, so there's a lot of other calls that, that CRESS should be going to and that you all have stated that they can go to for a variety of different reasons, but then that's how their time is being spent. So, you know, these are some of these discussions. And of course, we're going to delve a lot more into these into this data and um, because there's quite a bit in there and, and I haven't had the time to look more closely. And that's why we need to put this data again on for the next um, agenda, right. um, I, I mean the next meeting and on the agenda for 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 us to discuss. Um, and, and I completely agree that you know is this what Cress was intended for? And I guess I guess my thought process also was I mean, wondering if it was a staffing issue versus an issue of there's so much going on during lunch that they need assistance because it's unsafe. Um, and, and, you know, I could see that perhaps not having safe staffing levels could create unsafe, you know, a feeling of unsafety for the children. But I also, again, take it back to the idea of like, we don't want Crest to be seen as another way of surveilling people and like adding to that school to prison pipeline scenario if it is in fact, you know, a surveillance issue, um, and, it, it is, you know, hopefully they're able to build relationships with the young people and, and they're able to, you know, be a positive presence and influence. But again, I wonder what kinds of things it might be taking Cress away from in the community if if that is going to if that is going to be a de facto ongoing strategy for staffing the schools, which I don't think is the appropriate way to staff the schools. And I'm, you know, I'm not saying Crest needs to stop doing what they're doing or, or anything like that, but I think it's again, a concern. Um, and Crest has certainly stepped up to fill some sort of need, but whether it's a, a public safety need or, or a school need, I have a little bit more question about. Um, but I, I hear Deborah's point about wanting to make sure we get to delve into the data a little more and perhaps we should put in another request just to have kind of these fact, you know, face sheets for lack of better word, um, up until. Yeah. But, but I mean, you know, at, but, but to Allegra's point though, is like, this is ridiculous in terms of why do we, as, as the CSSJC, who is the group that was put in place to monitor the recommendations of CSWG. One of the recommendations is CRESS. One of the recommendations is to make sure that CRESS is successful. We've been asking for data for, for months and we're told that there was no data. And so we had to resort to public records requests in order to get the data. And then you all have data. So why is it that, that we can just get this information without having to go through the rigmarole of a public records request? Okay, so I... Um, I uh, believe that what I've said in the past is that the data sets are inaccurate and incomplete, not that there was no data. And there, um, and I, I mean, I've repeatedly said, and I um, will stand by the statement that the record keeping from, uh, for that first data set is inaccurate. Um, I mean, when you see it, you will have an opportunity 
um, to review it for yourself and make your own assessment of that if you choose to, you know, um, but it, uh, the, the accurate data has, has only been collected, I would argue, since November 6th. And it is still, I would also argue, um, an ongoing challenge for the department because as with any sort of data collection, you need um, everyone to be uh, on board uh, completely 100% accurate in their recording of the of the data and in their methodology and this department is still the responders are still actually um, learning grasping refining their collection uh, their data collection skill set you know that and that's just that's just the reality of it so um you know it it is it is still a, a work in progress and i think even once the Qualtrics system is in place, um, it will still take some time because um, it, because there's so many human hands who are collecting the information, everyone has to be inputting it in at 100% in order for you to get 100% output. And it's gonna, it's, you know, it's just gonna take, take some time. That's, you know, that, that's my uh, opinion, but, you know, I, I, know that we have been working really hard to make sure that everyone is clear on the definitions, is clear on the call types, is clear on when they're, um, on how they're recording different incidents. So if I go out and I um, respond to call tap A and I mark it as A and someone else goes and does the same thing, but they mark it as B, you know, the information is inaccurate. and and so it has been a real challenge to get uniformity around the collection methodology and um, around the definitions and act and actions. You know, it's my opinion, but that's what I that's what I believe to be the case. And I think if you if you were to look at the first data set and compare it to the second data set, um, that you would probably come to that. Um, same conclusion because the responders actually have more responsibilities that are akin to what the community safety working group wanted and desires than they did previous to December 18th. Like there are more things that there are part of their responsibilities now than they were before. So the information that was collected before you know, I would, in my opinion, had far less to do with the work that was desired of the department than now, because their ex their responsibilities have expanded during the interim leadership um, um, team. Well, I mean, again, we're going to to look at this information more closely. We're gonna add it to the next month's um, agenda and talk about it in more specifics. If you need to have, Pamela, I don't know if you need to have Sar Sergeant Griffin on or what have yeah. you, but we're really going to dissect these uh, for the next meeting. Um, and, you know, obviously we're gonna redact whatever needs to be redacted um, because obviously we don't want to, you know, include any, any names and, and things like that. in, in this, uh, in this request, when we share it with the community, um, but we'll add the, the public records request with the redactions um, in terms of identifiers or any, you know, personal information. Um, but we do want to, to make sure that we get into these numbers. And I guess for me, it's just like, you know, I hear what you're saying about the 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 data possibly you know being skewed or what have you. But the thing is is that as the the group that is in place to you know assess, help, monitor, assist, support, you know, we do need to have some data. We can't continue to be blind in terms of what is going on. You see what I'm saying? And that's why, like I said, that's why you know myself at Allegra had to resort to doing a public records request. It's not as if, I don't have other things in my life that I'd rather do than, than submit a public practice request. You see what I'm saying? So so my thing is, 
you know, we had to resort to it. So moving forward, if there's a way, right, to just make sure that we are able to get some data, you know, relevant to the template that you all have here, what have you, and especially since now it's being dispatched and things like that, I'm assuming they have some way that they're capturing data that that the police capture data. Well, the, the, yeah, so you have the CAD reports that that's part of the of the pack. That's no, probably I know. I, I, the, the, I, the, the easiest thing to capture because there's a system in place. It's it's actually the internal uh, data collection that's more more of a challenge than the CAD reports. Yeah, I get that. Uh, so that's why I'm just kind of like, but if we could have that, you know, continually, because like you said, right, it ends on the day that I submitted the public records request. So for us, what we're asking for is just like, you know, prior to each monthly meeting of ours, if we could get the the that report a few days before, you know, at least a week, let's say a week, because for me, I'm a busy person. I have right. a lot going on. I don't have time to just be reviewing data the night before, you know what I'm yeah, saying? So if we can get so the data it, a week before our meeting yeah. so that we can look at it, so that we can share it with the community and so that we can discuss it at our meeting. That's right. what I'm so, asking for. Right. And so um, I think that that's a conversation that, you know, obviously you'll have to have with Camille. She's hearing this, but mm -hmm. she's going to be the director. It won't, it won't be me. So it won't be yeah, my, I get deci it. my decision to make. Um, and, you know, you can have more conversation with her when you guys meet with her. Yeah, no doubt. And I, and that's good, you know, and I understand, you know, like I said, with Camille, obviously today was just an intro day and things like that, but I did want her to hear our conversation because, you know, that's really the expectation. And I do think that uh, Sergeant Griffin would probably be the best person to answer those questions or perhaps uh, with Pat Newman. Um, um, she has returned full time to the police department. Um, obviously back to her regular job. And so I will, I, you know, I can make the request. Yeah. If you um, could. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, then, but it will depend on her schedule. At yeah, the department. definitely. Yeah. All right. So then if her, so if, um, yeah, if you can ask Sergeant Griffin and Kat, um, to see if they can attend our next, um, meeting, which will be, um, you know, second Wednesday, um, then, you know, in May, then if that would be great because yeah, we're going to talk about it and we are going to share it and we're going to add it to the packet, um, you know, for the next meeting. Um, so hopefully we'll have people that can explain it to us. If not, we're going to end up making our own kind of conclusions. Any other questions from folks? I guess I have a quick question. Kind of, it's more like a comment or a confused comment. Um, going back to the middle school, um, crest responder, wouldn't that have been, like who would have initiated that call? Would it have been the someone so from it, the school? Yeah, it, it came as a request from the interim superintendent to the town manager, um, to the department. So it came at the request of the of the school department, and um, the you know it's two two responders teams of two they've been rotating in the responders have been involved in actually two I guess three programs at the school or two additional to that so um, there is a morning movement program um, that happens. And then there is another program called RISE. Um, the morning movement is, um, I think, a program that involves the police department and the school department. RISE is an initiative of the um, rec department with Cress and DEI and the police department. And it's a Saturday mentoring program um, that's operating for like, I think, I think initially it was scheduled to be like eight weeks, but now it's seven weeks. And uh, that's Saturday mornings from uh, nine to 11, I believe. Um, and so we have two responders who are attending that. Um, and then the responders are rotating um, in pairs of two um, through uh, for the lunch um, hour. 
and the request was for assistance throughout the the remainder of the school year. I think because um, because of the staffing shortages that they have, they needed additional um, support when there are large crowds of you know larger groups of students. I shouldn't say crowds, but I don't. Know. Okay, so they've yeah. been needing assistance due to shortage, but we don't know what how they are assisting. Oh yeah, we know how they're assisting. But I mean, the request came at from, this was not something that this department initiated. No, the, you know, the, it was from um, yeah. Superintendent right. Doug Slaughter, yeah. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. So the, the request came from the, from the superintendent to have um, CRESS responders present during the lunch hours. It's, I mean, it, it is, it is um, I haven't attended, so I'm saying this without having been there um, in person, but uh, essentially, the responders are helping to monitor the larger numbers of school of students that would be gathered during the cafeteria. Um, so, as uh, and I can't remember who said this, but it has um, turned out to be an opportunity for them to actually build relationship with students, and they have um, seen students that participate in the other two programs and and lunch. So, you know, I I think it is not something that. Um, the department uh, has committed to doing uh, forever, but this was a need. And so we're trying to assist another, you know, department for lack of our, our in, of the town with a need. Um, so. Is yeah. this request something that the school would typically ask of the police? Um, so the police are involved in other, uh, in other programming at the at the school, yes, but I don't. Would they would they do this specific type of uh, um of a, you know of request? Would they answer a request like this? I think you'd have to ask that question to the superintendent and the and the police department. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Pamela is the same question that I had asked, and 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 Everald is asking the same thing that I had had asked, which is. You know, is this the best use of um, Cress's time, mm -hmm. um, given the fact that, like we've been saying, that they are an alternative to uh, policing and public safety? Right. So um, I would. They cannot think... be seen. They cannot be seen solely as a social service um, um, department. And I get it that the school needs the help, but it's even more reason as to why the school needs budget and and funding as opposed to it being Cress that is going to be the one using, you know, the time to now, you know, do lunchtime, um, you know, and yes. also, like I said, you know, the other part, because they are, they are public safety, are we really sending the message, as Allegra said, that we're monitoring kids? You see what I'm saying? I, I, yeah. In, I, in, in the schools, in the school. So it's almost kind of double whammy. One, is that the best use of the time? Two, what what message are we sending to, to, to the kids that they're there monitoring them? So, so I know. would say that um, in response to the uh, um, to whether this is the best use of the Crest Department time, um, at this point in time, there has been no call that has gone unanswered because two responders were at the school. Um, so there's the capacity. And I, I think we were very clear when we met with the school department that if there were not capacity, and we have not, there have been days when we haven't gone. I mean, it is not our number one priority. So we have priorit prioritized other things in the department. Um, and when there have been conflicts, we have simply said we're not able to go because there are other things that are more pressing for the department. So it has, this has not been an area that we have prioritized, but we have certainly tried to be good partners with the school and have gone when, we, when we're when we able to. And no other call has been um, neglected or gone unanswered because, um, you know, responders were there. Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, they're, they're they're not at capacity because they're not being utilized to the full potential. Because right. which, obviously, which like I right now, right. they're not responding to noise complaints and not responding to low level disturbances and not right. responding to exactly. all of the things so I, that we had I, I envisioned. Think, right. Can, so I can, think, I can I finish? Can I? Oh, go ahead. 
Yeah. So so and and since they're not being utilized to to, to capacity for for all of those other than yeah, so they have all this free time. Right. And so is so, it is it filler? Yeah. So I don't I think that I there is no disagreement about that. But I think that um as I said, like it has not been prioritized over other aspects of the work. And when other aspects of the work, um, you know, if there were if uh, other aspects of their work were more demanding, then the um, the answer would be no. As and as I've said, we've said no because we have prioritized other things in the department first. But do they have the capacity now? Now they do. Will they always have the capacity? No, yeah, probably not. Okay, other questions. I think we can move to the next agenda items. And like I said, we'll revisit this um, next month. Um, thank you, Pamela, for answering these questions and asking um, Sergeant Griffin and um, Kat to see their availability to attend next month. Because we will, we will be discussing this again. So are we on to DEI updates? Yeah. Okay. So I um, have only been able to return my attention to DEI in the last uh, three days. Um, the last several weeks have been really busy trying to prepare all of the stuff for uh, Camille's onboarding. Um, uh, there are several events that are coming up, um, AAPI, Jewish Heritage, Youth Hero, um, and Race Amity and Jennifer, please um, weigh in with details. Um, about that, the department was successful in applying for a grant from the Pioneer Valley Planning uh, PVPC for $15,000. We haven't received those funds yet, um, but um, we are happy that we were able to apply for the grant and receive them. And those funds will be used for um, probably primarily for cultural heritage events. Um, you sort of set you have as a separate uh, line item the resident oversight board but I can go ahead and, and speak to that the um, final report that was the community engagement aspect of the resident oversight board was completed and has been shared with the town manager um, the second aspect uh, the technical uh, support RFP was uh, released and that period has ended and um, we have received some responses to that RFP uh, when the town manager is has returned um, from his leave then uh, Jennifer and I will meet with him and assess the the responses and he would will probably make a decision about um, beginning that second part of the process for um, standing up the resident oversight board. So from my perspective, I think at the last meeting, I had said that I um, could see the uh, the possibility of the board being um, up and intact, you know, if not by the beginning of the next fiscal year, shortly thereafter. And I think that we're still on track to to do that. Um, so it's moving along quite well. Um, I don't really have any other, I, I, as, as I've said, I've been distracted by things with the Crest Department, so I don't have any other DEI uh, updates, but Jennifer, you might have, have things to add. Um. Well, we already talked about the event, so that mm -hmm. I've given updates to. And then I would just say that- Oh, Jennifer, continue. for Juneteenth, when is that going to be? Is that going to be on Juneteenth or The goal day? is to have the Jubilee as well as the um, collaboration with Ancestral Bridges on the 15th and then to do a separate e small scale event on the actual 19th. Okay. All right. So then that will that's forthcoming in terms of information on those? Yep. Okay. Great. Thanks. And so, um, I would say that we still continue to do the the staff monthly trainings that we've been doing, um, for the for the staff who choose to sign up. 
and that's been going pretty successful. We always have at least 10 to 15 staff. That so when you say staff, this is town staff? Yes. So you, you're providing what kind of training to town staff? Just different kinds of training. The last one was on, was Katz, and she did a training on Pamela. On, 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 uh, on gender. And the one that's coming up, which will be next Friday, is uh, it's it has a, a catchy title. It's uh, What's in a Name? And it looks at, um, at inclusive uh, language, both in terms of pronouns, as well as other inclusive language and terminology. And then um, following that, there will be the three that are ha that are scheduled for this quarter are what's in a name, bystander awareness, and white fragility. So those uh, workshops are um, have been given on a monthly basis now for over a year, um, um, and they're staff only events. And then um, uh, the one thing that has faltered, and I think I probably said this at the last meeting, you know, just we. I simply haven't had the capacity to do the department only or department specific, I should say, workshops, but um, our hope to restart those in May. So during the first year of employment, Jennifer and I met with every department and um, delivered a, a DEI workshop that was tailored for the specific department. Um, and we will start that again, but you know, they just did in the last six, seven months, they have not taken place. It just didn't have the capacity to do them. So we've done our monthly workshops, but not our department workshops. Okay. Thanks. And was the, um, community training about microaggressions, did that end up getting held? Cause I know it was on the day of the snowstorm. I, I feel like the those events are like cursed because every time they're scheduled, there is a snowstorm. Yeah. Um, so it has been postponed. Okay. Um, Thank and you. yeah. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. that is scheduled for I want to say May 5th. Is that right, Jennifer? I think it's May 2nd. Okay, so might maybe maybe May May second, but it's been postponed until May. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the things that um, that I'll just say publicly is that space is at a premium, um, even more so now because the library is going offline, and um, and so everybody wants to use the you know either Munson or the Banks uh, Community Center, and so it's been very difficult to find space to hold some of these events in, in town. Um, and um, um, what, and I'm, I say that to say that, you know, I, we had hoped to plan to have a public reception for Camille this week during her first week, and there was no space at the end. And the earliest available uh, date um, that was sort of like towards the end of a week, like it, I didn't think a, a Monday night event would be um, that helpful was May 25th. So May 25th is was the first available date for us to have uh, a public reception for Camille. So is that the day it's happening? That is the day. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you'll let us know so that uh, yeah. folks mm -hmm. that want to attend. Yeah, it's, it's a Thursday evening. So yeah, was... most likely I'll be out of town, but um, but yeah, it'd still be good to to let folks know. Um, uh, so one question that I have, I know that, you know, it's, it's almost the end of the, well, we're, we're going towards the end of the fiscal year, you know, budget time and things like that. Um, is, has there been any information from the town manager? Because obviously, you know, I don't have the time to attend all these town council meetings and or finance meetings or what have you in terms of budget for Crest, budget for DI, DI, Resident Oversight Board, Youth Empowerment, Multicultural Center. Do we have anything in terms of those? Right. So um, for the CREST budget, uh, Kat Newman and I worked on it, and we did make requests um, for additions to that budget for a number of reasons, um, primarily because we're unsure whether there will be funding for, a, for the department through the Department of Public Health. And so we tried to 
hedge our bets by um, anticipating that if there were not DPH funds available, what would we need for the town to support um, the department? The, the town's um, budget supports um, all of the responder positions and the um, director position. Uh, the DPH budget has su provided support for programming and services. And so the department will, um, if that money is not funded by the governor, um, then the department will take, definitely take a financial hit. Um, we've tried to be strategic about um, the use of ARPA funds. There are some ARPA funds that we are trying to, to utilize, but the federal government um, changed their protocol for the use of ARPA funds. And so one of the reasons why the um, resident oversight technical um, RFP needed to go out um, really quickly and, and have responses due really quickly is that in order to fund that process through ARPA, the deadlines had to be moved up. So um, the short answer is that we've tried to anticipate what the department's needs might be um, if there were a shortfall from DPH. Um, um, we've tried to think about what we might be able to use from um, any remaining ARPA funds. And um, we've submitted a budget, um, you know, that reflects those requests. And of course, it's a process. Um, um, we had our preliminary meeting. There will, I think, be one more that maybe Camille will be able to attend. We had our preliminary meeting with uh, Sandy Pooler, who is, um, I don't know what his formal title is, but he is um, acting in the role of as finance director in the absence of a finance director and working with the accounting department. Um, so, um, so those conversations have taken place. Um, the indication that we have, have received is that, um, you know, it's going to be a difficult year for the town concerning expansion of, of all budgets, but we've, uh, we're very aggressive in, in requesting, um, money for the, for the Crest Department. Uh, for the uh, youth empowerment, that has not been, uh, that responsibility was taken by the town manager who has stated that he was going to form a working group to work on that issue. So that's not something that I have been working on, um, nor have we worked, um, I think you mentioned the, um, Multicultural Center, yeah. right? Multicultural yeah. Center, right? Yeah, that hasn't. That's that no. Has, no. Um, for, and what about and what about Rob? Is there money for Rob? Um, I know that the that well there. I know that the um that Cindy Pooler has had conversations with the town manager about what the um uh, financial support for the resident oversight board might uh, look like. So. Okay. Um, oh, so a question, because that is one of the things that, um, you know, I talked to, I ran into the, the town manager at the police chief, um, you know, the, the, what is it, open forum. Um, and he said that, you know, because I asked him, you know, that we've invited him to CSSUC a, a variety of times, because we, we want to ask him some of these questions that I know that obviously is not in your bailiwick, it's in his bailiwick. And um, and he said that we can meet with him um, individually. So Allegra and I want to meet with him. I want to set up a time to mm -hmm. to meet with him. So who who do I contact? And Angela you, Mills. So Angela Mills. And um, can you provide you know her number? Um, you don't have to do it right here, but yeah. if, if you can send me an email um, with her number, um, so that then we can schedule that because yeah you know we have a series of uh, questions because you know obviously we've been CSSGC has been around for how long now like almost two years and um, you know he's never you know come out to meet with us so there's questions that we need him to answer but I guess we'll, we'll go to him then. Any other questions from the the rest of the members? 
um, I guess in terms of the youth empowerment stuff, I know um, there was the survey that the AmeriCorps volunteer had worked on and then there's yeah. no more AmeriCorps volunteer. So is that survey still going out to youth? So and I think uh, Jennifer will have to weigh in. I believe that um, that she met with one um, class at the high school um, the survey is still live, but, you know, I, I think the honest answer is that nothing really took place, right? Because we were, we, you know, I'll just say for myself, I, I had higher hopes of productivity from the AmeriCorps member than we actually realized. And so, um, it, you know, that was somewhat dis disappointing, but, um, so I think that we're, you know, that we are really going to have to renew those efforts again um, at the, you know, over the course of the, really, I think if, I think what I would advise is that over the course of the summer, we devise a plan to start some youth empowerment activities and um, um, try to, to use those activities as a starting point and then to try to have conversations with youth about where they would like to um, to see further efforts. I really, I mean, at, at one point, and I think I we had this probably was um, early last year had said that I that I thought that the plan are are the activities that were mentioned in the community safety working group um, were an ideal sort of blueprint to start with some activities. But then there was a question um, in the um, among this group about where are we going to have the locations and whether you know the the spaces that were available were not ideal and um, you know space is even now even more of a premium um, at this point. But I think that that's the starting point. Um, I and um, one of the things that we tried to do and we are still trying to do this with CRESS is to partner on this issue of youth empowerment. Um, and one of the reasons for the partnership with CRESS is because of the way in which they are funding, they are funded, they have more uh, uh, capacity to, in, to actually support um, youth empowerment and youth enrichment activities than the DEI office does. Um, so they have actually, um, one of the responders has um, has submitted a proposal. Of course, Camille hasn't, I don't know if she's had even had an opportunity to read this or weigh in or what her thoughts would be, but to, um, to think about some additional programming that we might be able to do um, for the next academic year. But, you know, the truth of the matter is very little, if anything, got done um we just it yeah just fell apart that's just there, there's no way to to sugarcoat it it just fell apart speaking of space actually mm -hmm. um so i was at the town council meeting where the town manager presented his plans for the remaining arpa funds and there's a lot that was allocated potentially to the bang center renovation so was dei and or cress consulted about space they might need or time frames they might need in terms of space being available like yeah. later hours or... so so i actually think i mean you know again this this is camille is hearing this for the first time because we haven't had a chance to really talk um or update her on all of these things i think that there are um um, some possibilities for um, expanding the hours that the building is open, but they have not, I mean, they've, they've been very, very, very preliminary discussions. Uh, the bulk of the money that has been set aside for, um, for the renovations at Bangs are, um, are really, uh, um, monies that are set aside for infrastructure. Um, so you might be surprised to know that the building does, is not up to code as far as like um, fire safety. 
um, the kitchen needs to be um, needs to be remodeled. So uh, the bulk of it is not going towards activities or a space that would support DEI or CRESS, but they are going. It is going to much needed infrastructure, and um, evident of that is that uh, I, I think the elevator has now been out of um, commission for over a month. And um, we are told that uh, the necessary parts, um, you know, that it might be out for a little bit more. So although it, it is a lot, it's a, it sounds like a large sum, it's going towards um, needed repairs and not really towards remodeling space for DEI or for the Crest Department. Um, the DEI space, um, it, I was happy to see today that there is some work being done. So when you guys were visited the last time, there were a ton of boxes and things at the end of the hall for, because the current space at DEIN has actually been designated for the health department and DEI is supposed to move to the other end of the hall. And that has been under renovation for um, since last summer. Um, so we are, uh, we are hopeful that we will be in that space. Um, I don't know. I don't know whether it'll be by the beginning of the new fiscal year, but it, it's likely that we will at some point move into the space that is designated for us. I'm not sure if you can answer this question um, or not. And if you cannot, that's okay. So I understand that um, there's money for um, from the ARPA funds. And it sounds as if from what I just heard that some of that money may go towards the bank center renovation. Are there clearly defined rules as to how to qualify and who qualifies for this money? For ARPA? Yes. So um, it, there are, um, I am not the best person to answer the, the ARPA specific questions. I do know that, um, that the guidelines for how it may be spent have changed dramatically. And so, um, and the deadlines for some of those decisions, um, as I mentioned with uh, the resident oversight board, some of those deadlines moved up. Um, so, um, you know, we really anticipated that resident oversight board RFP going out after having a, a discussion with the town manager about the first, um, and it had to go out really quickly. So, but the, um, the uh, you know, so we don't have a finance director. We have someone coming in as a consultant and that individual and the comptroller would be the two people who would be able to answer uh, specific questions about ARPA funding. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So it looks like the next item on the agenda is ARPA funds. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, just to kind of say, I don't know, Pamela, Camille, obviously, I don't think we have any other questions for them, right? I don't think so. If they want to head out because I know it's it's a late night. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I look forward to meeting you all. Us you too. as well. And what about Jennifer? Jennifer, does do, do Jennifer need to stay? Well, she's our staff liaison, so. Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> See, Jennifer, I was trying to help you out. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd like to have Jennifer around. I, 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 I saw that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Much um, appreciated. <laughs> so in terms of ARPA funds, I know that we have had ongoing public comment, I think even back in the minutes that we approved earlier from last year about the 
inequitable distribution of ARPA funds. Um, and having attended some of the more recent meetings and seen some of you know the the, the asks from community in terms of money to go to Amherst Media or money to go to the Black Business Association of Amherst or money to go to Amherst Community Connections and how none of those groups received anything in the final kind of report out of what the town manager was planning. I had taken it upon myself to write a letter on our behalf to address that, um, which obviously I didn't send. It was to discuss tonight. Since we do have a quorum, we could vote on whether or not to send it. Um, because I do think that, A, it's something that the community has brought to us over and over again. Um, and it is a matter of social justice and equity. I think one of the things I know Everald had just asked what the kind of parameters were for ARPA funds. And my understanding was that they were COVID relief funds and it, and they were supposed to be distributed to people who were most impacted by COVID. Um, and so obviously looking at all the research, there's you know, high risk medical groups, there's low income communities, and there's, you know, black, indigenous, Latin, Latina people were all kind of in those categories of people who were more directly impacted. Um, so, yeah, it, there were a number of requests put forward by different groups um, headed by people of color and they were denied. Um, so I wanted to put forward the letter. If we can look at it, we can decide whether or not we want to let me pull it up on a word document. Yeah, and just to, so for me, uh, um, Allegra, since you, you did go and maybe, I don't know, Febril or any others have gone to some of those, because I've gone to some of them, but I, of course, because of everything, you know, things have been super busy on my end, I haven't been able to stay for the entire meeting. So where are we at? I know that the town manager did his report in terms of where he is thinking of dispersing the ARPA funds. Have decisions been made or not? When are decisions supposed to be made? Do we know any of that information? So it seemed a little vague. I I can't. I think the meeting was the beginning of the the end of the middle of March. Mm -hmm. Um, but basically, he gave a presentation, and the three big chunks of remaining money were to go to the bangs renovation. That was about 2.5 million, I think. Then 1 million was scheduled or was so it was planned to go to building solar at the new school. And then basically any of the remainder of the funding, um, which would be 300,000 that isn't allocated to anything else, but say there's money that's already allocated to something that doesn't get spent on that one thing would all go into road repair, which is clearly an issue in Amherst, but I don't think it's an issue that was driven by COVID. Mm -hmm. Although I think the way that they have now reframed some of the ARPA is that like, well, COVID caused inflation and road repair is more expensive now, so you can use it for that purpose but I don't know that it necessarily addresses the disparities to different communities that COVID created or exacerbated. And um, also I'm all for, for solar, but why is it being used and also being used for solar? You see what I'm saying? Right. For the people, um, as opposed to funding the most vulnerable in our communities, which, you know, I think per your letter, I don't know if you want to add your letter, up on the screen. Um, I just, you know, really I just want to ask, um, since I, because I, I think we've been hearing about this for a while, for the people that were denied, were they given reasons as to why they were denied? Not, not that I've been made aware of. Because I'm because I when I, when I saw the agenda, I was doing some. Um, research and mass.gov has a lot of information on ARPA funds. 
and there's an office of ins the inspector general that people can make complaints to. So I imagine if there is a process to do that, then if someone applies, they have to be given a reason as to why they were denied, and then they could voice concerns later on as to why they were denied. Mm -hmm. Well, Avril, as as far as I know, I know that um, from BBAAA, they've they've uh, put in a a complaint. I'm not sure if it was to the same office that you're talking about, but I know there is a complaint right now um, in regards to the distribution of opera funds. Um, so I think like those avenues are being utilized, but I don't know if there's any relief um, happening. Okay. Pat is in the audience. I don't know. She has her hand raised. I am in screen share mode. I don't know how to make things happen. You should be coming on right now. Thank you. So th thank you for your flexibility. Can people hear me? Mm-hmm. So uh, I want to respond very quickly with Emerald's question. So with my group, BBAA, they were denied, some, some of my members that apply were denied for illegal reasons. They were told they applied late, even though there was still money left. The hair extension, um, MS extensions applied and she was told that she applied late. We have some members who applied, they were told the only condition to get upper funds was to rent a storefront in Amherst, which is illegal. That's not what the upper funds uh, stated. That was also, as we all know, Hazel's. They applied on two categories as new startup and existing, they were, all, they, were they were denied because they said they, owed, uh, they are so much in debt that the upper funds will not help them. The same bid and chamber that denied black owned businesses, uh, our town gave um, Drake $300,000 that is run by the wealthiest, the most rich, richest, uh, land developers in our town. So what our town did in conjunction with bid and MS and uh, the chamber was illegal by denying the most vulnerable that deserve the upper funds. And so my group is demanding a robust audit. Our town did, you know, distributed the upper funds on, on, uh, inequitably. And in terms of what are the general use of upper funds, the main purpose was to help those most impacted by COVID, to help towns and cities who were impacted by COVID infrastructure. However, our, our town, decided to make up their own rules. So this is not over yet. The scandal is going to be much larger nationwide because BBAA will keep pushing. We're not going to stop until the truth, everything is exposed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Um, also, let's just do a time check because we still have a variety of different things on the agenda. After this letter, we review the letter. Can we just talk about the school committee and then and then table the other? Um, yes, and I would actually propose tabling G until we know who the inter who the next police chief is going to be, so that that can be a conversation mm -hmm. with yeah, the that police. makes sense. Yes, yeah. so, um, which was. 
recommended to me by interim police chief Ting when I asked him to come talk to us about that. So, uh, mm -hmm. okay. So yes, I agree. Because it's 8.56. Okay. Um, so... Yeah, I read the letter. The have um others read the letter. Do you need time to kind of, because you can maybe scroll up, leave it there yeah. for a little bit, and then scroll down, leave it there for a little bit for others that haven't read the letter. I think I would just add um, Allegra a Youth Empowerment Center and Multicultural Center too. We need to we need to put that on the table. I know we've been focusing on youth empowerment and and Rob, but we need to put the Multicultural Center. So here, where yeah, it says, okay. yeah, exactly. Just say and and Multicultural Center. We need to keep that on the scope too. Um, and just so people know that this was taken, the beep, I'm pointing at it like you're sitting here with me, the, the, the bullet points were taken from the public comment that was submitted that was the proposal that BBAAA sent to the town council and town manager. Um, and I would feel completely comfortable adding in information about, you know, Another BIPOC-led agency, Amherst Media, also made a request and did not receive any funds. Um, if people feel that that would be important to add as well, because I know this is highlighting the Black Business Association, although they were shut out of the first round. Um, so there is you know, something... This is something we've heard more regularly. I do think that the point about the other nonprofits were also told in the last round to apply for this round and then nothing, no funding went towards them is my understanding. So you're saying like One of the reasons. Oh, go ahead, Deborah. One one of the reasons I I, I ask about um, qualifications and you know how business qualify and I and I appreciate the frustration um, that's been raised by Ms. Pat and others is that we need to make sure that if we um, voice concerns and complaints that we're supported by how do people qualify what are the rules pertaining to this and I understand that you know. Outside looking in, we're seeing that, like, to the, the, the most common example, the Drake getting $300,000. We should make sure that we understand why and why were these other business denied. And as I said, um, I, I was looking and hearing um, Pamela earlier about the rules changing as to how the money can be allocated and spended. I saw some of that, um, but... It, it wasn't very clear. Yes, there's there's generalization as to the intended purpose of ARPA, but I couldn't find information as to say, you know, here's how you apply, here's how you meet the criteria, here's, you know, here's how you get these funds. So I'm, I'm always mindful before we cry foul that we have something that supports what we're saying. So 
my understanding back um so as i'm gonna talk as a member of the affordable housing trust for a minute um so we were given like a big number, like you, this town is getting $11 million, right? The 11.9, whatever it was. And so that was, gosh, November-ish of 2021. I remember the town manager came to our meeting and talked about what would some helpful things be in affordable housing. Um, and so there was, there, there were other groups that he met with other town boards and that was during the time that this group was on hiatus um it was in between CSWG and CSSJC so he got a bunch of ideas and then you know kind of it's been there was a million set aside for the homeless you know trying to find a permanent location for a homeless shelter which has been purchased the vf the old vfw and then there was a million set aside for affordable housing which we didn't really have an accounting for up until last meeting and month much of that money has been spent already um and it was spent to kind of help with some of the pre-development things related to some of the new um developments that will be going up um and i don't recall if that was exactly what was suggested to him or not, but it, it's it was basically it fit into one of the categories of housing. And I think there was, um, you know, public health was a category. There was some money that was allocated for, you know, giving essential workers like first responders some hazard pay during that period of time. Um, so there were some broad categories from the offset that were set up that the town had allocated different, you know, different sums of money to, and then kind of the details seemed to be up to the town manager. Um, but I, I just want to make sure I I'm hearing you correctly. So it is possible the town received eleven million dollars. And it is also possible that from that eleven million dollars, none of that money went to a minority owned business. So the town received eleven million dollars. There was a breakdown of the money spent for the for the small businesses, and there was a category for existing businesses and and startup businesses. and from my understanding and from some of the things that uh, the former finance director pr produced, they did break it down into minority versus not minority, but minority was including white women as one of the categories as well as, so all women were included in that category and black and Hispanic and Asian. Um, but it wasn't broken down. So when we asked for more specific data, I believe there were two of the new businesses that, um, so I believe it was White Lion and Carefree Cakery that did receive some of the startup funds. But then none of the pre-existing businesses owned by Black business owners in Amherst received funding um, that had applied. So... And, and 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 there was money allocated for pre-existing businesses there was so I believe that there were about a hundred thousand perhaps set aside for the business community not including what the Drake was awarded okay that, that does add more clarity I appreciate that so I I, I don't think it is unfounded to ask then questions as to um, why none of this money went to any of these pre-existing black owned businesses um, or the black owned business association. I, I, I think it is, um, it is public money. Therefore there should be um, public transparency 
And so um, we should ask to say, um, you know, and I think we should have them tell us, like, what is the criteria for allocating, for distributing money to these businesses? And can you explain outside looking in, like an organization such as the Drake that is owned by, to Ms. Pat's previous comment, um, a wealthy developer receive such a large sum of money, but the businesses that are minority owned that are struggling didn't receive um, any such grant, you know, can you, you know, put um, pen to paper and say, this is a criteria and here's why you didn't qualify? I think I would, I would say that we've probably tried to ask those questions a few times in previous meetings and I don't know that we've gotten direct answers to some of them. Um, but I, I don't think they can, sh I don't think um, the town can shield how they spend this money. It is government money that right. came from the federal government. So there has to be um, some public visibility to it. Mm -hmm. So they may not want to answer the question, but um, I, I don't think they can refuse to answer the question. So I think, I know Deborah and I had talked about already trying to meet with Paul. And I think that, again, having him kind of answer those questions would be helpful. I think it's important that it is, that it also gets answered publicly, um, again, as it is public money. Um, so I don't know who would be the best person to try and get to answer those questions besides Paul um, in an in, interim in type scenario. I mean, isn't someone, wasn't there someone in, in charge off distributing this money? I, I mean, it, it may be one of those freedom of information requests that is absolutely necessary at this point. If, he, if they've not been answering the question, then, you know, filing the public request. I don't think they can refuse to answer that. Right. And I do, I know that there is somebody specific in the role. Um, and I don't know, Jen, if you have the answer, if you have something else to say, I, I don't know how to. I was just going to say there is an ARPA grant. I don't know if it's a coordinator position or manager, but mm -hmm. there's someone who deals specifically with the ARPA grants. Her name is Martha Martini. Her name's what now? Martha Martini. So, I mean, I, I, I get all that, but I still think it's important for us to, you know, even if we need to kind of tweak this letter, but I, I think we need to put something out publicly in regards to this. I mean, I, I you know, Allegra and I are going to meet, or at least scheduled to meet with the town manager. Who knows when he's actually going to set us up, you know, to actually meet with him. So, you know, time is, uh, time is ticking. Um, and this has been going on for a very long time. I think you should add to this letter, um, you know, we're asking for a full accounting of how the money was spent to this letter. I'm going to, if I may, tweak it and just say it. how it has um, impacted the most vulnerable communities, because I think that that's, or if that's okay, because I kind of, I, that's kind of the lens that I'm coming at it from is some of the things it doesn't seem like, I mean, roads are nice, but again. Yeah, I was going to say, I think if you do that, then a lot of it can be rolled into, well, we spent a million dollars to do this or to do that. But if we ask for full accounting, 
then we actually get like line items. Right. Is that an okay sentence to add? Yes. <clears throat> And so I just, to your, to clarify a little further, because I know um, this, the Black Business Association of the Amherst area is a 501c3. And so they've put together a presentation or a, the proposal that they put together was so that they would get the funding and some similar to what BID, I think, was able to do for the current communities, like help their members through the payments and then help the community who comes to their members through additional support. Um, so I think that this is not just to say that the individual businesses need the, the support, but also the, the collaborative that is the Black Business Association has a plan to work together as a community. Um, does that make sense? It does. I feel like it's getting late and my brain's getting fried. <laughs> I apologize. Um, so are we okay to take, uh, I don't know why there's so many spaces. Are we okay to take a vote on this? I am. Okay. Yeah. All right, oh dear. Um, so uh, I guess somebody needs to make a motion. So moved. Ah, thank you. Is there a second? I second. Thank you. All right. Um, Lisette, how do you vote? Uh, yay. Thank you. Everald? Aye. Deborah? Yes. And I am a yes. It passes four to nothing. So I will send the letter to, I'm going to send it to the town manager, the assistant town manager, who I believe is currently the acting town manager in the, in the town manager's absence, and I will send it to the town council as well. Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. And let's see. So in terms of the last but the last item that we will discuss tonight, which is the school budget proposal to town council. Um, so I think it was important to hear from Pamela tonight that the school had actually reached out to press to help with their staffing shortage, knowing that the proposal, so the proposal on the table is to restore any funding um, that was going to be cut from te teaching positions. But if the towns don't come up with that funding, then the cuts that were proposed are on the table, which again includes the restorative justice coordinator positions. Um, it includes basically putting all of the language positions at the middle school down to half time. It would lose um, educators both in special education and in the interventions that help, you know, kind of assess whether a person moves on to special education or not. Um, there would be cuts to the dance program. So there would be no more dance at the middle school. There would be a cut to the computer science teacher at the high school, cuts to the science department, um, and a restructuring of how the department heads work so that um also like some mental health right yes and and some mental i think one full-time position at the high school and a half-time position mm -hmm. at the middle mm -hmm. school yeah. um so it it amounts to 10 percent of their staff would be cut um if the if the if the town of amherst and then the three surrounding towns that are part of the regional district do not find additional funding to help the schools or do not rearrange their own budgets to. You know. So 
I think hearing again, just hearing that Cress is being used to do things because the school's already understaffed, it really drives home the point to me that like, this is again, an issue of safety in the schools because the kids don't have all the support staff that they need to kind of safely move through their days. Um, and it's an issue of social justice because a lot of the positions, well, especially the restorative justice positions are, were made to address the discipline disparities that were going on between white youth and black and brown youth in the schools. So again, that would be concerning if those positions are taken away, what will happen in the disciplinary tract for people. And just, I mean, they're already struggling so much. I just don't know how much more they can struggle. It's very concerning. Um, and these are our kids, you know, and where else are they going to go? We don't have a youth center for them yet. So what, what else is going to support them? Um, so that's my spiel. I don't know, uh, Deborah, if you had anything you wanted to add. I mean, I think you covered everything pretty well. I mean, this was really just an opportunity for us to say publicly that, you know, the 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 regional um, school committee did the right thing. I mean, obviously there was an outpouring of um, community, um, you know, just calling in, showing up and saying that for them not to uh, put it put ahead that proposal that would have cut those positions um, and that the positions really go towards really impacting besides, of course, a lot of other positions too, but the, the, the students that are most vulnerable within our school system. Um, and there's been cuts already happening because I, like I said last time, you know, my older son was able to take a lot more classes than my, my younger son that now is in the middle school, right? So there's already been cuts. And so they're continuing to make cuts. And, and this is not okay. It's not okay that our schools continue to always have to kind of beg and plead to keep critical staff in place. Um, especially as, as I was saying in terms of being a BIPOC person and then having the only, um, you know, black male at the high school who's doing an excellent job in the restorative justice position, then be cut, right? When there are not a lot of black males within our entire school system, you know, there was one other one that my son came across in the middle school and then he was terminated. And then now he's a para, I believe in the middle school. Um, and so it, that's not okay. You know, that's not okay that that excellent BIPOC teachers are expendable. Um, and so, you know, we just need to to make sure that we're being vigilant and that we're sending the message that, that this budget, you know, the Amherst and the other three uh, regions, um, you know, need to fund this budget because as Allegra said, and we all know, these are our kids, right? And we're not only talking about our kids currently, but we're talking about you know, kids that are coming after them too, to make sure that they have something, right, in, in in the school system. We're trying to make sure that we stabilize the school system so that, you know, kids that are here now and kids that have come before and kids that have come afterwards get a great education, As which is one of the things that Amherst is kind of known for, right, is its public education. Um, so we can't continue to, um, you know, just shave away at it and pick away at it, which is what's happening. Um, and again, to our most uh, vulnerable um, student populations. Um, so, yeah. So, you yes. Know, I, think, I think they said, would well, you know when's the date? I, I think I remember them saying there's a date when they're going to be voting on the... Yes. So, yeah. the 425, so April 25th, the Finance Committee is hosting a public hearing. Okay. on the budget at 6 30 okay. and then they will vote as to whether or not to recommend the budget to town council who will then have a meeting on april 29th to vote on the budget oh, okay. so the 20 okay so the april and the 29th will be at 6 30 also i believe so okay so hopefully you know someone can kind of send us that information so that then we can get out to our, our networks and things like that because we need to show up to, you know, as many of these meetings as possible and, and again, show our support. 
I don't know, Lissette or Everald, if you want to add anything else. No, I'm 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 in agreement with everything that is being said. Um, it's I I I was thinking out loud. Um, it's the the budget that's proposed is it published somewhere versus what the cuts are? Yes, it should be. It's on it's on the school committee page. Um. You kind of have to go digging around, but if you get to like the school committee page where they have their meeting list, you can go into their older agendas and then there should be like a document that it, um, okay. All right. I don't have anything to add, um, but just a question is this is this budget just for the middle school and high school or is it for elementary schools too so it is just for the middle and high school because the middle and high school are the regional district so they have um pelham shootsbury and leverett as well so there's like more of a process that they have to go through so the amherst elementary schools this year have um not had any instructional cuts. They did have, I believe, a clerical position that was cut and a custodial position that was cut, but they, um, there were two special education positions that were proposed to be cut, one paraeducator at the um, preschool that was proposed to be cut, and then the, ele um, the elementary music instruction position. One of them was slated to be cut, but then after the initial budget was proposed, uh, more money came forward from the state. I think they raised the raised the number that they were funding per pupil or something. So it, it actually ended up being enough to cover all of the positions that that were teaching positions that were planning to be cut. So that is like a glimmer of good news, but um, obviously it's still there are a lot of children who could be affected by that big cut at the at the middle and high school level so all right okay we can keep moving things right along moving right along all right we are not talking about anything else tonight we do we do have um our second public comment period. I don't know if anybody else wants to make comment. There are only two members of the public remaining. Um, if you want, you can raise your hands. If you don't want, you don't have to. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's see. Here we go, Miss Penn. Okay, I'll be really quick. Thank you guys for voting on the letter. I really appreciate it. I would like to suggest that you guys also send it to media, to MSND and the Gazette. Thank you. Thank you so much. And have Thank a good you, oh, one thing. Yeah. So I think that during the public comment for the school budget, I think the push should be to use the money that is set aside for the uh, Banks Community Center to fill the gap. And the time can borrow money for infrastructure. They did that, you know, for Jones Library. I think that would be a white support to borrow money to bring Banks Community Center up to date. And also the Biden administration infrastructure bill, you know, there are other places that money, you know, could come from to upgrade uh, Banks Community Center. So let's push for that. You know, use that money you know, towards restoring uh, positions this year. And let's worry about next year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Um, we had Brianna as an attendee, and I thought she had raised her hand, and now she appears to not be here. No, so, I don't think she raised her hand. She okay. wasn't. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I think that that's all for public comment. Um, so our next meeting will be May 8th at 6 30. Um, so obviously we have our usual Crest DEI updates, uh, Rob Youth Empowerment. Um, 
I believe we'll have Crest rep records as a separate thing and we'll make sure that those get redacted and sent out again. It is a lot of information to digest, um, but it is, I think, important. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did want to mention that I forgot earlier that so there was at the town council meeting like two meetings ago that they had there were some members of the public on zoom who spoke and made some pretty anti-semitic racist um remarks um and so i think i think it would be helpful to look at the what what the rules are around that because unfortunately there's a lot of stuff that's protected by the first well, not unfortunately, but there is a lot of stuff that's protected by the First Amendment, and um, and some of it is considered hate speech as long as it's not inciting or threatening to di directly to people. But I think it would be helpful for us to maybe talk about if that does happen in our meeting, how can we still hold the community? Because it is really unsettling to hear some of those things said, but also to know that we can't um, legally cut that off so I would like to put I don't know first amendment on here yeah first um, amendment uh, concerns yeah during public comment maybe let's put it like that because that would really be the only time since everything else right. is I don't know um Jen if, or if there's if somebody in the town manager's office or town council like because I think they had to get an opinion from council. I don't know if that's something. Maybe I can ask, reach out to them and just say, like, as a board who might come into contact with this, we'd like guidance. Does that seem reasonable? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and... And then um we'll we'll still keep the civil rights complaints and holding future town forums on. Yes. And hopefully the future town forums we can actually get to next time because I think if we just try and set some mm -hmm. projected dates and places that could not take up too much time, but the actual planning for them might take more. Yeah. Um okay. Anything else? Well, in that case, it's 929, and I am going to adjourn this meeting. I second and third it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Nice Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.